Good evening. I see so many familiar faces, and I'm so happy to see you all. The gentleman up here looks very pensive, doesn't he? Very serious. I'm waiting for people to settle in the back. As many of you know, my name is Gwendolyn Mayer, and I'm the archivist of this institution. And I might have a little bit of an interest in history. I hope you all do, too. Um, we have several amazing programs coming up in the near future that have to do with history, so very briefly, I won't remember the dates, but I will remember the very next exciting one to me sounds like Lost Hotels of Cleveland. So if you have an interest in local history and specifically architectural history of Cleveland and hotels that have gone by the wayside, you know, please make it a point to attend that one. Polly Reynolds at the back of the room is holding up a brochure of all of our history programs, which are also located on the tables, and they'll give you the dates and times. And remember to go online and register for them, please. The next one we have coming up would be Mr. Logan Beer, who is going to come and speak to us about George Washington, yet another president. Michael is turning me up. That's what that strange bubbly noise is. Um, and in November, we have a hometown guy, George Armstrong Custer, um, there is a new biography about him, and several of you may know that George Armstrong Custer was born in New Rumley, Ohio, sort of close by, 30, 30, 35 miles, I think, perhaps. So I invite you to come listen to the story of yet another famous Ohioan. So that takes us through November, and um, we do have an interesting lecture about women in December, which really isn't that historical. But I have to tell you, in 2015, there are some phenomenal programs coming up. And believe it or not, the library, to some degree, has sworn me to secrecy. So I can't tell you specifically, but I can tell you in January of 2015, we're going to kick off a phenomenal year of a great deal of programming. And I invite you all to keep up and abreast of those news about our programming by looking at the websites and looking at the history brochures. Um, without further ado, I want to point out the fact that in the back corner of the room, there's a little box for donations to help us fund these phenomenal programs. Um, and as you know, you have a public library, and of course it's paid for by tax dollars, but we can always use a little extra help. So if you have a kindness in your heart for our programming or for libraries, please take a minute and drop a bill in the box and we'll be thrilled. And if you can't, we understand that too. <coughs> Now, let's talk about the man of the hour. He was our sixth president, and he looks very pensive, doesn't he? And you've all learned what his pet was, haven't you? You all got the little brochure from the vignette room? Not one person saw it. Oh, yes. My granddaughter saw it. I want to bring a real one into the library. They wouldn't let me. I'm referring to Mr. Quincy Adams, who supposedly had a pet alligator. So you should go visit the vignette room and see my rendition of the alligator in the East Room. Mr. Kaplan, however, is a gentleman from Maine. He has a very strong interest, believe it or not, other than John Quincy Adams, in trees. He is a very distinguished scholar. He knows exactly how many rolls of microfilm are in the John Quincy Adams Library collection. And he can tell you exactly the source on the website where his diaries are all very public for us all to read, which is a wonderful thing, right? He um, is a former educator at City College in New York City. And I learned today there is a, dis uh, there is a difference between a normal professor and a distinguished scholar. And certainly we have a distinguished scholar. He was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, and he was also nominated for the National Book Award. He has done other books that are available outside in the door and later in the rotunda at our signing reception. The Learned Al is selling his book on Lincoln, and he has a book on Mr. Carlyle. And I have not read either of them, but I would tell you that his forthcoming book has some connections to his previous books. And he can decide to divulge or not divulge. He may be able to divulge more than I can tonight. Without further ado, I'm going to let you talk, and we'll have a wonderful conversation with Mr. Kaplan, who will answer some questions in here, and then immediately afterwards we'll adjourn to the rotunda, as we traditionally do, and have a reception, you know, the cookies and the coffee and the punch, and the book signing, and you can have conversations with Mr. Kaplan then. And perhaps you can talk to him about the wonders of Hudson, 
or Ohio, we need to convince this main person that Hudson and Ohio are, is a great place. Um, he once almost accepted a position at Ohio State. Without further ado, friends, please meet Mr. Fred Kaplan. Thank you, Gwen, for, uh, for that uh, entertaining introduction. Uh, I, I, do, I do probably uh, recognize myself, but I'm not quite sure about the alligator. Uh, I, I have not seen a source for the alligator story, even though it's been widely retailed and uh, is uh, on, on various <laughs> websites as if it were indeed a fact. So that John Quincy Adams, a very fastidious man, uh, kept a alligator of indeterminate size, we don't know what we're talking about here, really, uh, in uh, a bathtub in the White House. I accept it. Now, uh, and, and, uh, at, a, at the last moment, uh, it was decided to cast an image of John Quincy Adams up uh, on the screen for you. And uh, before I talk any, any more about John Quincy Adams, I, I do want to say that appearances notwithstanding, he did have a sense of humor. This is a daguerreotype, and I don't think you've ever seen a daguerreotype. Uh, the subject of which was smiling. Uh, it took a long time to, to take the daguerreotype. The subject had to sit still for a long time. And of course, these ancestors of ours, particularly in the 19th century, the daguerreotypes were first developed in 1820s, 1830s, and this is about 1846. These ancestors of ours did not have a concept of um, of selfies and you could <laughs> smile for the camera. They, it was, it was uh, a portrait or the, the daguerreotype or cameras uh, and, and uh, camera photographs that were taken during the 19th century were, were not, were not um, the, the opportunity to be, to be imaged was not thought of as a sort of celebratory, let's have fun cake. No, a very serious moment in which something of genealogical and family historical significance was being memorialized. So you think of the gear types more as memorial moments, memorializing moments, rather than the way we think of photographs. However, all that having been said, John from the Adams was a very serious person. Now, now, I feel sure like I'm a serious, serious person. And I wish I'd smile. I feel like it's smiling you. I guess it comes as kind of easily to me as it comes to you. I don't know. Something in my background. Something in my heritage. Something in my mother's milk. I can't say it. But I try. I do try. Uh, and I, but but it, uh, like John began, I'm a serious person. And uh, I do serious things that I take very seriously, and I take very seriously coming here to Hudson and communicating with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something that one does lightly. There's an effort for you to come here, there's an effort for me to be here, and, and, and the effort it involves a certain engagement with ourselves and the past, and the past and ourselves. I've never, I've never been, been to Hudson, Hudson before. Uh, I arrived this morning. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to be here in this town that I know something about because I did some research before I came. And uh, because I had a sense of northeastern Ohio as uh, a place of significance and seriousness and historical importance in um, in American history, in American culture, and in the American uh, cultural memory. And 
uh, as you well know, it was once called the Western Reserve, and as, as I walked around uh, Hudson today and admired uh, the attractiveness and the authenticity and the seriousness of the people who created and recreated and are perpetuating uh, this town, I uh, course, so quite a number of signs that it had on them, Western Reserve this or Western Reserve that. It's an area that early in the 19th century, well, was throughout the middle of the 19th century, was closely associated with the abolitionists of various kinds. And that sort of connects Northeast and Ohio, Cleveland and Hudson to John Quincy Adams. In 1843, Adams, who was 76 years old, accepted an invitation from the newly created Cincinnati Astronomical Society to speak at the laying of its cornerstone. Adams was very interested in astronomy. He had been a student of the stars, if you will, of the constellations uh, since his early adulthood. He was fascinated by heavenly bodies and uh, being, as I said, a very serious man and a scholar probably the most scholarly of our presidents ever, and the most learned of our presidents ever. He studied everything he was to study about the, the history of what had been thought and said about the heavens, from Ptolemy to Copernicus and on. He also was a great enthusiast it's not also a fall down, it doesn't. He was a great enthusiast for the creation of astronomical observatories with up to date modern telescopes, we're talking 1843, uh, that uh, would enable us to learn more about the heavenly bodies, about the stars. And as you all know, and as I learned this morning, you have one of the oldest, I think it's the second oldest, so I was told, astronomical observatory in the United States, right close to your body, within streets of where we are sitting and, uh, and commuting together. Now, it's a small building, I, I noticed, and of course the astronomical equipment, the telescopes, et cetera, are uh, of a fairly rudimentary kind compared to what we have. In 1843, uh, Columbus, a rather substantial city in Ohio, even in 1843, uh, had uh, raised the funds and decided uh, to, um, to become, to show that uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, was a city looking not only towards the stars, but looking towards the American future, of technology and science, the world we know today. And Adams, when he received this invitation at the age of 76, was uh, hesitant about going. It was a long, he'd never been uh, west of Niagara Falls. Uh, and going west of Niagara Falls in 1846 wasn't all that easy. Uh, and he had to travel in a circuitous way in November 1843 to get to, 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 to Cleveland first, along, went to Buffalo, uh, Lake Erie, Cleveland, Ohio Canal. I don't know if that still exists, the Ohio Canal still exists. The Ohio Canal uh, down to, I think, as far as Columbus, it was as far west as he ever went. It's presidential years. 1825 to 1829, were of course, fell behind him. And in 1843, at the age of 76, he was five years from his death. He was essentially a healthy man all his life, but he had many illnesses that were um, telling in certain ways and limiting in certain ways, but never any life threatening illnesses, and he determined that he was going to make this trip 
and uh, he received a very, very warm welcome in Ohio. For reasons that have to do with uh, the Underground Railroad and what Hudson remembers as part of its history, and uh, the Western Reserve, settled by Yankees from Connecticut, uh, and uh, the Western Reserve as a hotbed of abolitionist feeling and discussion and argument in the 1830s and 1840s. In Columbus, on the first day there, just after dawn, a mulatto came to see him. The only time, he said, and I'm quoting Gospel of the Adams memoirs now, the only time, the man said, when he could expect to gain access to me, to return the thanks of the colored people of the city for my exertions in defense of their rights. To many blacks, he was a heroic figure. My book, uh, John Quincy Adams, Visionary American, begins with a statement that Adams is a president about who most Americans know very little. Ranking presidents, of course, is a kind of slippery activity. Uh, but in the ranking uh, that many historians make, uh, Adams uh, inhabits sort of the netherworld of the list. And the question that's often asked and answered affirmatively is, was Adams a failed president? Uh, hardly worth deliberating about today. And that's a question, of course, that was very uppermost in my mind when I began considering whether or not to write a biography of John Quincy Adams. Well, my book tells a very different story. The totality of Adams' life, including his presidency, is a significant tale about about America, about John Quincy Adams' America, about Adams' accomplishments, and about his failures. Uh, it's a story not only about John Quincy Adams and America then, but it's also a story about America now. There's a lot about John Quincy Adams, his life and his times, and how he interacted with the world into which he had been born that uh, relates to the world that we are currently in. Now, the failure of John Quincy Adams' presidency resulted from the determination of his political opponents not to allow him any public policy achievements. They, they believed uh, he was an illegitimate president. And with the divided government, they had the power to do that. In addition, the pro-slavery land country South and West had good reasons to believe that Adams had strong abolitionist sympathies. That he favored a reasonably high price for government land in order to fund federal infrastructure products, pro projects, and to create a federal government that had enough funding to play an instrumental role in uniting the country through vision and through the impl implementation of that vision in various projects to help the country as a whole and to help the country feel unified. As you probably know, Adams was a one-term president. In 1828, Andrew Jackson defeated his bid for re-election. Jackson brought to the office of the presidency 
a rush of executive authoritarianism, demagoguery, the spoiled system under the guise of reform, harsh racism, strong support for slavery, and anti-intellectual ignorance. <laughs> you see how what a favorite president of mine and Jackson. <laughs> Without the constitutional provision that for every five slaves, three would be added to the total number of white people to be represented in a congressional district, the popular and electoral college results of 1824 and the 1824 election would have had a different appearance. Adams would have been elected in 1824 by popular vote rather than by the House of Representatives. The 1828 election, which was not nearly as close, would have been a closer still and far from the landslide that it's misrepresented as being. The 1824 election uh, in which Adams was elected and the first president, and actually the second president, to be elected by the House of Representatives. And I think the last president to be elected, I can't think of another one who was elected by the House of Representatives, was um, a uh, was constitutionally sanctioned and proper, uh, but uh, left uh, quite a number of people feeling that somehow that should be the way we should elect a president, and that the Constitution was, was, was defective in this regard. That's a defect, if you will, that still remains. If no president or presidential candidate receives the majority of votes of the electoral college, it goes to the House of Representatives, and each state has only one vote. And can you imagine what kind of politicking goes on there? Small states, big states, east, west, north, south, etc. And of course, in Adams' case, it was essentially the north versus the south, but very things happened that I, I, I don't have the time to go into it at this point. But suffice it to say that many of those who opposed Adams' election and they were mostly Jackson supporters, they were also supporters of Clay, Henry Clay, and William Crawford of Virginia, uh, thought that this somehow was illegitimate and not how a Republican and Democratic government should elect a president and vowed that never uh, would they cooperate. Other things happened to make them even angrier as uh, Adams went along and told them what he thinks the vision, what his vision for the country was. And they vowed they would never allow any, uh, any achievements in office at all. Adams became the only uh, ex-president to serve in the House of Representatives, where he served for 16 years, emerging to uh, popular and public notoriety as the most outspoken opponent of slavery and of the Southern stranglehold of the American government. All his life, he feared that the issue of slavery would result in the dissolution of the Union, that there was no way this entity created by the Constitution of 1787 with all sorts of compromises and the major compromise having to do with slavery, the existence, the existence of slavery, and the three-fifths rule of the Constitution, which gave the South much more clout in Congress and in the federal government than it otherwise would have had. And that three-fifths rule resulted not only in the election of Jackson in 1828, it resulted in the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Thomas Jefferson would never have been elected president in 1800 without those slave votes, those, you know, fictional slave votes. They were just extra votes turned over to the white ruling class of Virginia and the other southern states. 
Thomas Jefferson would not have been elected president in 1800, maybe never. And who would have been elected, re-elected, as a John Adams, John Quincy's father? So you can see that a lot of, you know, he has reasons to, be, to look unhappy about certain things. He carries every weight, if you will, of the past with him. And he, he carries that weight with a certain a certain um, uh, uh, strength and courage and determination, and at certain times he carries he carries the weight of the past in a way that reminds Americans of his generation always of the continuity between the past of the founding fathers and the middle of the 19th century. Because by the time he dies in uh, February 1848 in the House of Representatives, and it's carried to Speaker's office where he expires, uh, he is, of course, not only the oldest and most revered member of the House of Representatives, but he is one of the few only living connections between uh, the 18th century creation of America, because he was there at the beginning. He was there at the start. Because John Cousin was born when? In 1767. Died in 1848. I guess that's at the age of 81. And he was, uh, at, uh, he was the son of the second president of the United States. And so, in the 1840s, when he served in Congress, he not only was a distinguished congressman, but he was he was a, he was a, a kind of radiating presence of the historical past and the origins of the country. John Quincy Adams' career can be readily divided into uh, three three stages, just for convenience' sake, divided into three stages. The first stage, from 1784 to 1825, he served as the American minister, ambassador, if you will, we didn't use that word then, in Holland, then in Russia, then in Great Britain, and then as Secretary of State for eight years. And I just happened to admit, carelessly, that he was also the US minister in that period uh, at, uh, uh, in Berlin uh, to uh, the Kingdom of Prussia. So uh, Holland, uh, Russia, Holland, uh, Prussia, Russia, and Great Britain in that order uh, over roughly a 15-year uh, period. And then served as Secretary of State for eight years from 1817 when he returned to America from his long European service as uh, America's premier diplomat abroad uh, to his election to the presidency in uh, 1825. Elected in 84, but of course taking the oath of the presidency in March 1825. So in 1794, when Adams was 27 years old, George Washington appointed him to his first diplomatic position. Imagine. In 1848, there he is in the House of Representatives. People say, there's a man that George Washington appointed to, his, to, to be America's representative in Europe. And Washington, who, uh, uh, who uh, certainly had a high opinion of the young man, predicted that he would become the most famous, the most prominent, and important American diplomat of his era. And he was, as his father uh, described him, also the most traveled American of his generation. He actually started his travel as a young boy, accompanying his father, who had been designated by the Continental Congress to go to Europe to engage with numbers of European powers on behalf of the American Revolutionary Forces during the Revolutionary War. Adams went, in effect, to 
helped negotiate peace uh, between uh, the United States and Great Britain. But when you wanted to negotiate a peace with the United States and Great Britain, you went to Paris because the French were the key players and the French were supporting the American Revolution. And uh, it was a complicated and, uh, and a difficult assignment, as you know, yet also the uh, collegial companionship of Benjamin Franklin and that Thomas Jefferson uh, as the negotiating uh, committee uh, to move towards the Treaty of 1783, which created the United States of America in the sense that it was a peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States and said, we will allow the United States to exist. And uh, given the relative imbalance of power, Great Britain being this extraordinarily powerful imperial country in the United States, and not being the United States at all, but being 13 colonies trying to get together and, and, and do something in the common interest and having lots of difficulties doing it and disagreeing with one another and so on. Uh, and, and very little clout. Uh, we beat the British not because we beat the British, but because the British beat themselves. And then, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like trying to to keep supply lines going between the United States and I don't know Iraq or Afghanistan without modern technology, without airplanes or without without uh, any kind of, kind of engines, if you will, sailing ships that took six weeks to eight weeks across the, across the Atlantic and so on. Well, he spent, that is, Adam and John Quincy spent most of the next year, so roughly his 18th, excuse me, 11th birthday until uh, his, about the age of 18, uh, going on 19, he spent those years in Europe, in France, and in and in Holland. Uh, he attended schools, both those places. Uh, he hated going to school in the Netherlands. He was sent to a school in Amsterdam. And uh, as a very precocious young boy, he read immensely and was learning languages and in a very short time became quite proficient in French. Uh, he tested the, the, the rigorous old-fashioned traditionalism of uh, the, the Dutch schools, and he acted like an American and forced himself to get expelled. <laughs> he then accompanied the designee of the Continental Congress from Paris to St. Petersburg, Russia, because the language of the court of St. Petersburg was French. And the scene, he just spoke terrific French. And he was kind of old and wise and discreet for his age. And Francis Dana, who uh, was sent by the Continental Congress to go see if he could persuade Catherine of Russia to be friendly to the United States, which meant please give us some money, something to help us, right? Spoke not a word of French for we are an even more monolingual country than, than <laughs> we are now. Uh, when, uh, he, uh, when, he, when he returned, uh, when, he, when he returned from uh, Russia back to uh, his, uh, where his father was in the Netherlands and then Paris, and his mother and sister had joined, his parents there, he was determined to go home. He was determined to follow his father's footsteps, to go to Harvard, and to be an American. The great fear uh, that he had, and that his mother particularly, the wonderful Abigail Adams, and his father also shared, was that if he remained much longer in Europe, he would become enough Europeanized, Europeanized so that he would no longer be able to fit easily and readily into American society when he returned, if he ever returned. So uh, he traveled, uh, left his family in Europe, and uh, traveled 
to uh, back to the United States, which New York, and then back up to New England, where uh, he enrolled, he attempted to enroll at Harvard, and found that uh, his, uh, all his study, all his learning, all the books that he had read in Europe, all the tutors he had learned under, didn't qualify him for immediate entrance because he couldn't pass one or two of the examinations that the Sultified Masters at Harvard and the president of Harvard insisted were actually necessary if you were going to enter Harvard and take these courses. Meanwhile, the boy was a no, young man now, he was 18, he was international, cosmopolitan, uh, French, uh, English, and, got to learn Spanish, he was widely read, his Latin was pretty good, he knew some Greek, uh, he had done some mathematics and so on. At any rate, he, 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 like a schoolboy, he was chastised by the Harvard overseers and sent uh, to a, a, a tutor who happened to be the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the husband of his aunt. Uh, and uh, he studied for three or four months, uh, came back, and took the exams again. I remember Harvard was a very small place, and uh, at the time, uh, there, there are approximately 60 students in the entire university, and, uh, and, and, and a very small number of tutors and the president, uh, and uh, they, they sort of raised their noses and said, okay, you can... You can now enter young sir and take courses. Uh, the driving force early on in John Quincy's life was the thirst for knowledge. He had an immense desire to learn, to know. He had a curiosity about everything. Some things, of course, more than others, which is natural. But he, he was um, a, a dedicated student with uh, a kind of obsessive and driving seriousness about every subject that he studied, quite happy to be a student in an educational environment, learning from the classroom and from tutors, but equally confident that he could learn anything on his own, that books were the pathway to knowledge, that libraries were the home of learning, that this building was the place to be if you wanted to expand yourself as a human being. And one of the crucial ways in which you expanded yourself as a human being was through gathering information, <coughs> knowledge, learning things, and then being able to synthesize what you learned and make some good and effective use of it, especially in John Quincy Adams' case, as in the case of his family and his tradition and of the family fathers, by devoting oneself to doing good in the world. And Adams and his contemporaries interpreted not exclusively by the 1840s and 50s, but certainly at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century, they interpreted doing good in the world as fulfilling one's civic responsibility. Doing something for one's country. And it's not, it, 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 it's, it's not simply Patriotism in the, word, in the way the word patriotism is used now. You can say it's patriotism, of course, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's, it's a daily consciousness of the centrality of the relationship between yourself and the society that you're a part of in terms of making the society function well and improving it making it better. And it, of course, comes out of the, the revolution and everything that goes into it and the creation of the Constitution and the notion that we would be a self-governing society, a new thing on the planet. And these people have gone through the ends all his life, right up to the last, was 
keenly aware that the most important thing we had was that we were a self-governing people. So, if you were not involved in our self-governing, you were not being in John Quincy Adams' sense and in the family father's sense, you were not being, you were not being what? What, what would you fill in the blank? What were you not being? You, you, help me, help me. Good citizen. Good citizen, what else? What would you say? You're not being a good citizen, yes. Relevant? Relevant, you're not being relevant, of course. You aren't, you aren't doing, you aren't, you aren't engaging. You aren't engaging. But I, 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 I pause and ask you for a little help because it's hard to really capture the, the, the combination of, of intellectual and emotional essence that these people felt about this. It was, and this is a word that's occasionally used these days, sometimes a little too flippantly by the you know, CNN people and, and, and the MSNBC people. It, it was sort of an existential thing for them. It wasn't a matter of life and death. It was deeply, inwardly a part of self-definition. I think that's what I'm saying. Deeply and inwardly a part of self-definition. John Quincy Adams was very preoccupied with self-definition. As uh, a young boy, he began to keep a diary. Uh, he decided he had a talent for writing. And in his own way, in his late 18th, early 19th century way, different from our way, but in his own way, he can appreciate his way, he was a magnificent writer. His diary is the most significant record of public life in America from the end of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century. It's also a private response to public life, his own take on it, if you will, intellectually and emotionally, and to his own personal considerations and thoughts not only about uh, public life and government, but about literature and about morality, about religion, ideas, intellectual history, theater. He was an immensely well-rounded man with a variety of interests and an obsessive commitment to writing every day in diary. He began it when he was 11 years old. He didn't keep it continuously between his 11th and roughly his 20th year. Uh, but thereafter, he kept it almost continuously until his, until his death in 1848. He wrote almost every day in a diary. It was the companion he spent most time with. As a diplomat, Adams was proud, was most proud, of two of his accomplishments. And history books indeed remember him for them. Uh, they remember him particularly for the Treaty of Ghent and for the Adams Onus Treaty. History, alas, is sometimes fickle. And history is also porous. It has holes in it. That's because we have holes in our memory. And uh, these two extraordinary accomplishments aren't as well remembered today as they should be. But that's one of the reasons I'm here, right? The treaty again was signed in December 1814. It brought the war of 1812 to an end. Adams was the principal American negotiator, along with a number of other distinguished American diplomats and political figures. As you probably know, the Treaty of Ghent, signed in, in, Gel in Ghent, in, just say in Belgium, if you will, uh, between the United States and Great Britain, which brought the War of 1812 to an end. 
that treaty, treaty took, took a rather slow, slow boat, there were only slow boats then, to America. America. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and uh, on January 1st, 1815, a few weeks after the treaty had been signed, one, one of the most famous battles of American history was fought. The, Orleans, the British invading forces badly defeated after the peace treaty had already been signed. And defeated because of American common sense and British arrogance, military arrogance. They didn't know the culture in the country, just the way we do things these days without knowing the culture in the country. <laughs> equally far away from our home base as New Orleans was from London. And of course, if the Battle of New Orleans had never been fought, who would never have become president? My least, well, not my absolute least, but one of my least favorite presidents, uh, Andrew Jackson, would never have become a national hero. And never would have been, or probably, everyone can't say never, of course, one probably would uh, not have been uh, elected president. The other treaty that John Quincy Adams originated and had a great impact on American history was called the Adams Onus Treaty of 1819 1821. Uh, Onus was the Spanish ambassador to the United States assigned the duty by the court of Madrid to negotiate with the United States about an issue, about numbers of issues of great contention between the United States and Spain, which almost brought numbers of times the United States and Spain to war, at least to the brink of war, though neither country really wanted it. But what it did bring us, the treaty, is the state of Florida. And it also established the western boundary of the Louisiana Territory, which had been acquired by the United States in 1803, Jefferson administration. But nobody knew where the western boundary was. Who went there? You know, I mean, you know, it's like Continental Airlines, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. No, no way to get there, hard to go, few people went, did a little exploration, Lewis and Clark, but uh, uh, no man's land, indeterminate, no boundaries, what belongs to Spain, what belongs to the States, the Louisiana Treaty, which Spain thought was invalid anyway, because France had no right to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States, or the Spanish said it, they had good reasons. Saying that, and how much it belonged to, to Great Britain? Where did, where did Canada stop? How far south did Canada go? This became a matter of negotiation between the United States and the Spanish, and the result, the Amazon Treaty brought the United States of America as far west in the southwest as the Texas border, and in the northwest, it brought us to the Pacific Ocean, though. In an ambiguous way, in terms of what we claim versus what Great Britain claimed as part of Canadian uh, territory, uh, and the rest of the Northwest, of course, wasn't to become American territory until the Oregon Treaty in 1846. In 1817, and so the treaty of 1819 to 1821 took two years to go back and forth across the ocean between Spain and the United States and iron out all the difficult wrinkles. In 1817, President James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States, had appointed Adams Secretary of State. And he was indeed, for the eight years, of the Monroe administration, uh, America's negotiator in chief. And the signal accomplishment of the, that's associated with President James Monroe 
who Adams, though he disagreed with him on various issues, supported faithfully and well as Secretary of State. The single accomplishment of President Monroe, as we see today, was in fact the idea of, and mostly the words of, John Quincy Adams, the Monroe Doctrine. In the second stage of his career, Adams served for four years, from 1825 to 1829, as the sixth president. Controversial, difficult, and painful experience for him. Even presidents who have an easier time of it than Adams seem mostly happy to get out of that office. <laughs> Though ego usually demands it be after the second term. Washington refused to run for a third term. Why? Not because he wished to set a precedent. He had no idea what was coming next. Not because he wished to set a precedent. Because he was disgusted with the political situation. And he wanted to go home to Mount Vernon. Enough was enough. Jefferson couldn't wait to get out of public life and go home to Monticello. That, uh, you know, the only modern two-term president who seems to wish he still was president is Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> but he's so good at it, isn't he? You know, whether you agree with him or not, you vote for him or not, you like him or not, he's so good at it. You know, he just has just, he just loves the public spotlight. He has his charisma. He has his great voice. He has his great people-to-people -people touch, you know. And he's very, very smart. And he just loves the public stage. Heart attack, nothing stops him. And, 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 and he's going to be with us for a while longer. Maybe eight years more. Who knows? In the new world. So, as you know, Adam was elected to the House of Representatives, by the House of Representatives, in March 1824. And one of the examples, one of the, one of the examples of sight about Exemplify how how difficult his opponents made his president say uh, is um, the attempt by Adams to send American representatives as um, invited guests to listen and report back to Adams and Congress to a conference, they call it a conference, uh, created by the new South American republics, which had just come into existence, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, and thrown off the Spanish oak and become republics of sort joined by some of the Central American countries to be held in power. And Adams thought it was a great idea to send representatives to find out what's on these people's minds, what we can learn, maybe we can be helpful to them. They too are or at least want to be republics. And uh, he ran into a firestorm of opposition, an utter firestorm of opposition. Uh, and it, 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 it was a good example of how contentious things were in general in that, in, in that period and how especially difficult it was for parents. The general view of a, 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 a large number of very powerful uh, American political leaders was the president had no right to do this. Only Congress did. They wanted to limit the powers of the presidency, even in foreign affairs. Adams came back and said, well, I do have the right to do this as I see and read the Constitution. I can't enter into a treaty without the, con without being without the advice and consent of the Senate. I can't do X, Y, and Z, but this I can do. No, they said. Uh, not only... Uh, uh, can't you do this with your legitimate president anyway? <laughs> However, really, what was the main 
uh, local and dynamic and explosive source of the opposition was what we think of as racism. Uh, the, the federal government was uh, a uh, creature with a huge tail that wagged the dog. And the tail that wagged the dog was Southern slave state power, allied with certain northern allies, if you will, who for economic reasons were uh, happy to enter into coalitions with uh, the uh, Southern representatives in the Senate and in the House. And the general view was that uh, the inhabitants of South America and Central America were mongrels of a sort. There, whatever white blood was there was contaminated by black blood and by Indian blood. And even, even more uh, emphatically and dramatically, the uh, concern was that since the Republic of Haiti would be sending representatives to the conference, would that in some de facto way result in or be considered that the United States had recognized the Black Republic of Haiti, which had gone through a revolution and thrown off the Spanish and French yoke in 1797, 89, 81, 82, and become the first majority black country governing itself with great pain and difficulty and with great bloodshed and misery and poverty and disease and so on, well, and, and great internal conflict, of course. And what does that mean that the Republic of Haiti would be able to send, be able to send black ambassadors and their staffs to Washington? And we would have to greet them with diplomatic courtesy. Inconceivable, inconceivable to every level and there were lots of different levels, of course, of society and governance in Georgia and South Carolina, in North Carolina, in Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, just an example of what Adams was dealing with for the general view of Monty's opponents was that he was anyway, a closet abolitionist. And uh, that this was just another way, one way of sneaking into uh, American, white American society, uh, black contamination. As President Adams ran one of the most efficient administrations in American history. There were no crises that required bold and nation shaking decisions. The budget was always balanced. There were no blunders in the day of the country. Corruption was at a minimum. He had Adams believed in defining presidency as the Constitution defined it, as one of the three branches of government, not the chief branch of government before which Congress and the judiciary to bend and bow. But he also believed that the president could set forth a vision for the country's future. And his vision was out of step with the vision of many of his contemporaries. And it's had a vision of a country united and made prosperous by national infrastructure projects by, if you will, interstate highways, roads and canals, in which the federal government played a leading role in collaboration with the states, and absolutely with Andrew Jackson was against. A country in which the federal government became a leader of policy concepts that would rise above local and state sectarianism. 
it would, would provide a vision that would allow the states uh, to act as efficient and cooperative partners with the national government. Also, like Lincoln, who Adams anticipates and who he is a link to, Adams believed that the Constitution was a living document, that the Western territories, like the Western Reserve, belong to the entire American people, that taxing and being taxed were essential to responsible self-government that the country required a modern, a national, and a regulated banking system that Native Americans deserve to be respected and brought into the American community, that the federal government had an important role to play in the general welfare, in the creation of educational, scientific, artistic institutions, such as the Smithsonian Museum, which he played a major role as a congressman and created the National Parks, Service Academies, Land Grant Universities. This, this, this was not acceptable to the American people <coughs> in uh, the age of Andrew Jackson. And it still is um, uh, in expressed in slightly different ways a major ideological dividing line in American society. <coughs> How far should the federal government be allowed to be a part of our local and regional and state lives? But the main, the overriding opposition to all, to this vision that came from the pro-slavery for the anxiety that underlies so much of Southern society, from the creation of the country to the Civil War, and beyond, with the Jim Crow America and the civil rights movement, but certainly from the creation of the Constitution to the Civil War, is the fear that the more power the federal government has, the more likely it will be that as the population of the North increases faster than the population of the South. As Northern political clout becomes greater than Southern political clout, the federal government, despite what the Constitution says, will become the vehicle for the limitation, which is what Lincoln represented, no slavery displayed to the territories, and the eventual abolition of slavery. So anti-federal government policy in America originates, and if you look at the political map of America today, there's numbers of people, quite a number of people have pointed out, uh, you will notice, and I don't mean this in any, uh, in any, uh, politically partisan way, that uh, the states in the United States that are most anti-federal government are the states that you will see if you put over it a grid map of the Confederacy, with a few exceptions, are those same states. From 1832 to his death in 1848, Adams served as member of Congress from the 8th District of Massachusetts. He ran to Congress against the wishes of his wife and family. The old war horse could not resist fighting and continuing to fight. He was wily and clever. He was a great debater. He had extraordinary stamina, even as he got older, the age that you see him there. 
and gradually he became radicalized. And whereas he had not been in favor of abolition prior to his service as a congressman, he began gradually and then with a swift rush to say that uh, the slavery issue needed to be resolved either peacefully or by the spilling of blood. And since he saw no way that could peacefully end, no matter how hard he worked to try to end the gap rule, which prohibited any discussion of slavery, anything about slavery being mentioned in Congress, the Southern forces were powerful enough to enforce that gap, to place in, in, put in place and enforce that gap rule. By uh, 1844, after eight years of opposing it, the finally was able to eliminate the gang rule and became the most outspoken and notorious anti-slavery voice in the United States. The last three months that Adam served in Congress between 18 between December 1847 and his death on the, in, in the House of Representatives in February 1848. He served, he had as a colleague, a one-term congressman, this uh, lanky, gaunt, funny-looking fellow in the back seats with no seniority at all, who voted the same way on every issue against slavery, abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia, against the Mexican War, which was still in progress from 1846 to 1848, in favor of federal infrastructure projects. And when John Quincy Adams uh, stood up in late February 1848 to object to uh, a proposal, a motion that was being moved that would uh, would triumphantly praise American armed military uh, assaults in Mexico during the Mexican-American War. He suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, lost his voice and collapsed. The voice went up and said, Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams is dying. Two men grabbed his arms. Lincoln saw every moment of the death of a man who was to Lincoln a great hero. You are all great heroes for sitting through this. And uh, I have uh, been looking at my watch, and I have extended my time so that uh, we are now beyond 8 o'clock, and you have graciously sat here for a full hour. And Gwen wants to know, can you hear me? Uh, Gwen, Gwen wants to know if you still have uh, the, the will and the energy uh, to ask questions, because she knows I'd be happy to respond. As I walk around, we're only going to take two, and then we're going to let him go to her time for the signing. You can talk to him later. But I want him to tell you something that he told me earlier today I did not know. Please tell them about the Adams family and what they funded. The descendants. Yes, uh, the, almost all of this huge archive. <coughs> His lapel mic is on, so I'll so be helping him adjust that. So I can that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Anyway, uh, there is a huge family, Adams family archive. The papers of John Adams, Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams, Henry Adams, and a lot of Adams that you've never heard of. Uh, and, uh, all the Adams family, being uh, from Quincy, Massachusetts, right outside Boston, and early supporters of the late 18th and 19th century of the Massachusetts Historical Society gave the, the entire family archive, because not only were they all obsessive writers, they never threw away a piece of paper. <laughs> and they gave them all to the Massachusetts Historical Society, who were there for scholars. Uh, a recent generation, in the 1950s, late 1950s, of the Adams family, uh, gave to the Massachusetts Historical Society the funds 
not only to put all, all of the Adams papers on microfilm, resulting in 614 microfilm reels for scholars to extinguish their lives slowly, <laughs> but to find the funds to make hundreds of copies of the whole 640 microfilm set to distribute free of charge to research libraries, university libraries, college libraries throughout the United States. So any scholar or any reader who was interested in the Adams family or any part of the Adams could uh, have immediate right to fill access in your area, in your neighborhood, in your local library, in your university library, in your, in your largest public library to the entire library. It was a, a wonderfully um, civic-minded patriotic Two questions, and here's the first. Just quickly, uh, the relationship between John Quincy Adams and Benjamin Franklin, particularly with the uh, commonality with France. The commonality with France? France. Uh, John Quincy Adams was a young boy accompanied his father, as I said, to, uh, to Paris. And when they got there, um, uh, uh, Dr. John Adams, of course, sent by the Continental Congress. He's not vice president yet. He was an early voice of independence, etc. He's well known in the country. He's a member of the Congress. Congress is all there is. There's no executive. There's no judiciary. Congress is in charge of foreign affairs. So they sent John Quincy. They sent John Adams to Paris. And who was already in Paris representing the United States? Benjamin Franklin. John uh, Adams arrives, and uh, they get off the boat uh, uh, and, uh, and come up to, to Paris, uh, the father and son, and uh, they haven't uh, emailed or called in for hotel reservations. You know, travel was very different in those days, right? And so they get there. And they find that the whole city is crowded. There's no room for them. There's no place. So Benjamin Franklin, who's very good at getting cushy places for himself, set up, has already set up in a suburb of Paris in a, big, a huge villa and says, come and stay there. So John Quincy Adams, the young boy, gets to spend lots of time with Benjamin Franklin and is instructive and interesting for him. John Adams and Benjamin Franklin Contentious relationship. They do not really like it. And it's not so much that Adam, that, 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 uh, that Franklin doesn't like John Adams, but he thinks that, that John Adams doesn't get it, doesn't understand how to be a diplomat among the French. He's not suave enough. He's not really full right. He speaks his line. He's screwing things up. And Franklin is playing the role of American primitive. He's got his bucks in the hat. He's got all that stuff. He's, you know, uh, and they love it. The French love it. And they go wild, wild west, you know, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry. They're ready. It's Western. They love it. And so. And, and then, you know, and so, 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 so the contention between Adams and Benjamin Franklin sort of becomes part of their, their letters, uh, their, 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 how they think about one another. And the young boy uh, admires Benjamin Franklin, but as he grows up, sides with the role of his father, and it's quite critical of Adams. And what the Adams is, and what John Adams and Abigail Adams most of us criticize about Benjamin Franklin are his morals. Quick question. Uh, did the president look to England and how they were trying to eliminate slavery? I mean, I know it's a long time. Did the president look, uh, well, when he was in the House of Representatives, did he look to how England was trying to resolve the slavery issue? Oh, yes, yes, yes. England is a substantial giant step ahead of the United States in dealing with slavery. And uh, the end of slavery uh, in the West Indies, in the British West Indies, where most of their slave uh, governance is, if you will, the sugar plantations, etc. Uh, and uh, it's a complicated and interesting story. There's a whole library of, you know, of discussion and, and books about it. Uh, 
And uh, all right. so, so, British, uh, the, the British emphasis upon the British process of emancipation and abolition becomes um, a uh, forerunner of what America is to do. They will do it peacefully. We are to do it with over 700,000 soldiers, American men, dead, not to speak of the crippled, et cetera, et cetera. But, of course, they don't have the same problem we have. That is, in, in, in England, Scotland, and Wales, uh, in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century, now you didn't see many black faces, did you? Right. So we have it at home. They have it right here. Folks, I'm going to take him to the rotunda for the signing, but I hope you'll help me and thank him for coming to help me.